Would you all pray with me? Oh, Heavenly Father. God, we thank you for the gospel. We thank you, Lord, that um, our Savior did not despise the cross, but he willingly suffered the punishment for our sins. He endured the wrath of God that we as sinful people deserved, that we might be free from our sins, that we might be forgiven our sins. And, and before he ever did that, he lived a, a perfect life so as to be the perfect sacrifice for our sins, so as to earn the righteousness required to enter the kingdom of God, a righteousness that would be then credited to our account. We thank you that he was resurrected and that stone was moved for good and that there was much rejoicing in heaven and among the saints, those who, who were faithful to Jesus. And Lord, we, re we rejoice to this day because he is risen. He, it's not that he was risen, he is risen. And he is seated at the right hand of God. And all authority in heaven and on the earth has been given to him. Lord, we thank you for that promise. We thank you that along with the Great Commission is the promise that, that all authority has been given to you, Jesus. And that we go in your name and that you will be with us. Because, Lord, we require strengthening. Proclaiming the gospel, Lord, it does not come to us naturally. And I would say that uh, it's, it's the exact opposite of that. It's, it's that our natural response is to re recoil from the work of proclaiming your gospel message to unsaved people. Lord, we need instruction in this. I pray that this would be a fruitful lesson, a fruitful message from your word. Uh, so many passages compiled to try and portray this, this need, our, our need to proclaim the gospel to unsaved people. And Lord, as I pray that, I, um, Lord, I ask for prayer for the young man who, um, the young man who was shot for proclaiming the gospel this week. God, I pray that you would um, bring him back to health. Um, I pray that you would be with his family in this time. And Lord, if I can confess to you in my flesh, I, I thought this really isn't good timing, God. I'm supposed to compel these people to proclaim the gospel. And, and here they have this example of a man who was, who was actually harmed as a result of his proclaiming the gospel. But God, the church was built on the blood of martyrs. And God, we, we know that the word for martyr, which, which we associate with those who have been killed for their faith, that's the, that's the Greek word for to witness. God, we recognize that, that when we give our lives in service to you, when we sacrifice a, a life and limb for you, for your service, that your gospel message might be proclaimed, it sends an even bigger message. And so, Lord, I pray that you would use this. I pray that you would use this tragic experience, this, this result of a fallen world, this result of evil in this world, the enemy, the world, and, and the flesh of a fallen human nature. God, I pray that you would use it for your glory, that your gospel would go for I pray that this would be a catalyst to start change in this, this country, Lord. That America would look on and see this is a real message, and evil hates it, and that they would be compelled in their, in their very soul to repent and believe the gospel. God, let it be that it inspires our people, that it doesn't discourage, but rather it encourages them to proclaim the gospel. His faithfulness. We thank you for this young man's faithfulness. Lord, I pray that you would bless this message and that you would do all that you see fit to do today. And I pray it all in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, church, I would encourage you to stay standing for the reading of God's word. We're going to be in 1 Corinthians today. This is going to be our jumping off point as we dive into a systematic discussion on proclaiming the gospel. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning in verse 18. Paul writes to the church in Corinth, 
For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. A stumbling block to Jews and folly to the Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling, and my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God." This is the word of the, of the Lord. You may be seated. Sorry. <laughs> Halfway through the sentence. It's the word of the Lord, though. I'm sure of it. I'm sure of it. Though the sentence was difficult. Well, welcome to the Shepherd's Church, folks. My name is Max Monahan. Um, I am welcoming you not as the shepherd in the name, the Shepherd's Church there, but rather as one speaking on his behalf and, and only that so long as I am proclaiming to you his message from his word by his spirit. Now, for those of you who don't know, I am the lead pastor here and under shepherd of the chief shepherd Jesus, but I wasn't always a pastor. Perhaps you've heard where I've shared with you a bit of my story about how I came to repent of my sins, and put my faith in Jesus after living a life of sin. But long before I truly trusted in him for the salvation of my soul, I actually, I actually put my hopes in something else. You see, I was one of those kids who never really felt like he fit in. Uh, we moved from the Midwest, uh, kind of a um, in-the-cuts, you know, combined second and third grade classroom, small school kind of city. You drove 45 minutes just to get to the Taco Bell. Um, we didn't have a ton of mo money, and we moved to Granite Bay, of all places. So a little bit of a culture shock. You know, I was rocking hand-me-downs uh, for my older siblings. I was also sensitive, artistic, and socially awkward. And on top of all that, I was a boy with a girl's name. Yes, I'm told Kelsey was a boy's name first, but by the time I was a kid, it seemed like every girl in every class I was ever in had the same name as me. And let me be clear, I did not have the confidence to pull it off, okay? Now, we moved to California. I convinced my parents to let me go by Max, a name that my dad just kind of pulled out of a hat, basically, and I welcomed it because I was tired of the ridicule. Now, all jokes aside, all of those things combined to make for what I would call not the best experience in elementary school and junior high. I remember seasons at a time just dreading going to school. 
because I knew that I was going to be mercilessly picked on, either for my name or my wardrobe or something that I said. Sadly, in some cases, that was at the hands of the same kids that had no trouble being my friends after school, of course, when no one else was around. Now, I don't tell you all that to make you feel bad for me, but to tell you what happened next. See, sometime in junior high, I really grabbed a hold of something called rap music, hip-hop. Now, let me just preface this by saying I am not condoning secular rap, not even a little bit. Don't listen to it. It's not good. But for me at the time, it was everything. The, the braggadocious lyrics, it was confidence to be imitated. The, the more thoughtful songs felt like they were speaking directly to my soul. And the way that they talked about overcoming their circumstances, that chip on your shoulder, underdog, can't tell me nothing attitude, well, that gave me the resolve to press on. Looking back at it, yeah, it was a crutch. <laughs> It was idolatry, but at the time, it was precious to me. It was my lifeline, and I would become the biggest advocate for the cause for the next several years. But I wonder, how many people have felt that way about some other thing? Maybe it's the sport that delivered the athlete and his family from a crime-ridden area, or the advocate who helped somebody beat addiction, or, or maybe the opportunity that freed a family from political oppression in some country Maybe the employer that took a chance on you when you were uneducated and underdeveloped. The list goes on and on. Those are so near and dear precisely because they have drastically altered the course of our lives. But here's the deal. All of those examples, they've only ever improved or delivered us from temporal circumstances. Circumstances in this life. When in reality, for those of us who are in Christ, we who have repented of our sins, we have been saved from far worse and into a far better life. How precious should the gospel be to us? How much more should we want the world to know all about it, to be educated on it? How much more should we want them to believe it to be true and to taste for themselves and see that the Lord is good? How much more? Well, that's what we'll be talking about today. The title of the message this morning is, In This House We Proclaim the Gospel. In this house we proclaim the gospel. We are coming to the end of our House Rules sermon series. This one and then one more next week. And then we'll be moving on to an Advent sermon series, and we've been getting into what uh, we believe here at the Shepherd's Church, as well as uh, with a few exceptions where there is some room for disagreement, we've really gotten into values that every biblical church should hold across the globe. These are things that you should be looking for as you consider what church to call your church home, whether you should become a member there, and after all, we do this with everything else, don't we? When we meet up with our realtors, we have a checklist. It's got to have enough bathrooms because so-and-so takes long showers. That's me. It's got to have room for a home office or a fireplace, etc. We do this with colleges. It's got to have the right degree program. It's got to be affordable. And who am I kidding? What college is affordable these days? Maybe it's something like it's got to have a scholarship for me. But just like home shopping, school shopping, or whatever, we should be just as intentional if not more intentional with the church that we choose to attend, to become a member of. Because with the body of Christ, there's a covenantal aspect to it, a pledge that we give to one another to um, enter into membership, to love each other, to serve one another, and to call out sin in one another's lives when we see it, as well as to point each other to Christ, of course. And so the criteria that we're looking at when we look at churches should be serious. Let me just say, if you missed every other Sunday in this sermon series, and you could only go to one service to find out what we're all about, it's this one. In this house, we proclaim the gospel. 
This is the issue. At the end of the day, your pastor could be preaching through the Bible, and maybe he's using outdated sources or renderings of the Greek uh, on a given passage. Maybe he's not leading you in the fullest prayer. Maybe communion isn't quite as reverent as it should be. Maybe he doesn't key in on the sanctity of human life or God's design for men and women. Maybe you disagree with his take on the role of elders and deacons, but at the end of the day, if they get the gospel of Jesus Christ right, if they're faithful to preach it, if they're faithful to call you to preach it, you are in good hands. You're safe. And on the flip side, if they get this part wrong, but are the greatest Bible teacher of all time, although how great could they be, because Jesus says it all points to him, if they prayed the most elaborate and pious prayers, if they had the greatest church government anybody had ever seen, if people came from far and wide to see how they do sacraments, if they did all of that but got the gospel wrong, I would say steer clear of that church. Run for your life. And the truth is, if they're off on the gospel, they're probably off on all those other things too. This is the issue. And so our big idea today is a simple one. We who believe the gospel are called to proclaim the gospel. We who believe the gospel are called to proclaim the gospel. We're going to see it in three points. We're going to talk about how you need to dwell on the gospel, how you need to defend the gospel, and how you need to declare the gospel. In a way, what I'm calling you to do here is uh, what we are Excuse me. In a way, what I'm calling you to do here regarding the gospel and what you are called to do with the gospel can be summarized in Paul's charge to Titus. Now, mind you, this is a specific charge to a specific man in a specific context, but our charge is similar. Paul writes, Titus 1.9, He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught, so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. Hold firm to the gospel, rebuke those who contradict it, and give instruction in it. Hold firm, answer contradictions, preach it. That's our outline for the morning. Here's our first point. You need to dwell on the gospel. You need to dwell on the gospel. What do I mean by that? I mean that we need to call it to mind and to actively consider our thoughts, our words, our actions in light of it. If you've ever read Paul's charge to the Philippians in Philippians 4.8, where he says, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. This would be the best thing for you to dwell on. Think about this thing. Think about the gospel. But hold on. Let me back up for a moment. Maybe we should define what we mean by the gospel first. There's a lot of gospels, quote unquote, floating around out there. Well, the true gospel, the word for gospel, means good news. It comes from the Greek word euangelion. It is the message of salvation. It is, in effect, the cure for the condition that we all suffer from, the cure for that which ails the eternal soul. No big deal. And before I go on to further define it, let's talk about some gospel imposters first, shall we? Some examples of what the gospel is not. The gospel is not the social gospel, which has become especially prevalent in our day. According to one definition, the social gospel is a movement within Protestantism that aims to apply Christian ethics to social problems, especially issues of social justice, such as economic inequality, poverty, alcoholism, crime, racial tensions, slums, unclean environments, child labor, lack of unionization, poor schools, and the dangers of war. Now, it's not that those things aren't important, right? We can all agree that those things are important. They are. But if the gospel is a cure for cancer, which you have, the social gospel is the equivalent of your doctor telling you to take two Advil and keep yourself hydrated, but never actually telling you that you're suffering from a malady that will eventually kill you. It's treating a symptom not the heart of the issue. It's not that those things aren't good. They are, and Christians should care about them. But when issues that should not be the main issue become the main issue, we've got a problem. 
That would be an example of reducing the gospel to something that it's not, something that's a component of the faith, but not quite the main thing. But what about if we were to add to it? Well, then you would get something like Roman Catholicism. That would say that the gospel alone isn't enough to save you. You also have to add works in the form of seven different sacraments that you have to adhere to. Otherwise, you will not enter salvation. It's effectively the grace of the gospel plus works equals salvation. But if we were to let the Bible tell it, we'd find that grace plus works equals no longer grace. Romans 11.6. That's what Paul was up against when he wrote to the Galatians. See, it turned out that there were some guys called the Judaizers. They were inciting the Gentiles, the, these new believers, to participate in Jewish rites as a part of their newfound Christianity. They said, it's not enough for you to repent and believe the gospel. You also have to be circumcised. You also have to attend the temple. You also have to offer sacrifices. They were effectively calling them to add works to the grace of God. Listen to how Paul speaks to them. This is Galatians 1, 6 through 9. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. So we've talked about false gospels. But what about the true gospel? The good news. Well, this is the message that says that there is a holy God. A God who made all of this. He created the heavens, the earth, and every creature that dwells therein, including mankind. Mankind, in fact, was the pinnacle of his creative endeavor. He was designed to glorify God in communion with him forever. And he created them male and female. But man sinned. Man did the one thing that God said you can't do. He said, don't do this one thing, and that's exactly what that first man did, and that's exactly what we do down to this very day. We call that sin, that disobedience to God. It's actually choosing to glorify ourselves and our own desires over the one who created us to glorify him. And that sin, it produces destruction. It brings death into the picture. That's why death is here in the first place. It's because of the fall. And worse than all the destruction, all the havoc, all the death that sin brings into this picture, it creates enmity with God. Which means that we are are in the midst of a relationship that cannot be repaired on our own work. Sinful man can't get back to God on his own. And we see this all throughout the Old Testament. God raises up a nation of people for himself from one man, Abraham. That was the nation of Israel. But they too would rebel against him time after time after time. But in the midst of that bleak picture, God had a plan. And it was a Trinitarian plan. God the Father uh, set out the work of initiating this redemptive plan. Jesus was going to accomplish it, and the Holy Spirit would then apply it to the hearts of believers. He was going to do the work that we couldn't do. And in this plan, Jesus Christ, the Son, was sent down to earth. He was born of a woman, 100% God, 100% man. He, He added flesh to his deity. He lived a perfect, righteous life, as we prayed earlier. A righteous life that we could never live on our own. And then he was willingly betrayed and seized and tortured and ultimately executed for us. To bear the punishment that our sins deserve, knowing that every sin committed is worthy of death. It's punishable by death. But praise be to God, he was resurrected. On the third day, he rose from the grave. He defied death. And just as Christ was resurrected, so too will anyone who repents of their sins and puts their faith in him be And what I mean by repentance is is that you, you recognize that there is a God and you have sinned against him, but you don't want that anymore. You want his way. 
And when I say you put your faith in him, I mean that you affirm in your heart of hearts that you, what you hear me saying right now, you believe because the Holy Spirit has given you a new heart, because he is telling you that this message is true. You believe that Jesus, he did all that. That he lived for you, that he died for you, that he was resurrected for you. And you believe that apart from that, you would be hell found and that would be well founded, well deserved. But instead, you know that you now have peace with God, that you've been reconciled to him because of him. That's that faith piece. And that resurrection part of it, that's twofold because you're resurrected now in that you've been made new. Like what Paul says in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And you will be resurrected bodily in the life to come. And that means that Christ will return to judge the living and the dead. And all those who are found in Christ will rise. They will put on immortality, imperishable bodies fit for eternity. And they will join, join their beloved Savior for all eternity as he executes justice on the wicked and restores fallen creation. That's the gospel. That's the message of hope that we have in the gospel. And it could be put more simply. You're a sinner before a holy God in need of a Savior. And Jesus Christ was that for you. Guys, we never graduate from this. This is where we live. We go on to deeper knowledge of the faith and greater maturity in the faith, sure. But this truth and our need to constantly remember it, it never changes. It stays the same. Frankly, if I may soapbox for a second, this is where I think a lot of people in the church get it wrong. If you understand the difference between covenant theology and dispensationalism, or you have a strong opinion on infralapsarianism or superlapsarianism, but you don't mourn over your neighbor who is still in their sin and destined for hell, or you don't see your own need for a Savior still, you are missing the entire point. The ways of God are vast and unsearchable, and we ought to plumb those depths. But this simple message of salvation, the simplicity of this gospel message, it's meant to shame the wise. It's supposed to appear silly to the uninitiated, the unredeemed. That's why Paul wrote that it was folly to the Greeks and a stumbling block to the Jews. The Greeks, with all of their wisdom, they couldn't wrap their mind around the simplicity of it all. They thought it was lunacy. What do you mean it's a free gift? What do you mean anybody who repents and believes can get in? Here's how one second century Greek philosopher put it. Their injunctions are like this. Let no one educated, let no one wise, no one sensible draw near. For these abilities are thought by us to be evils. But as for anyone ig ignorant, anyone stupid, anyone uneducated, anyone who is a child, let him come boldly. Clearly a misinterpretation of the passage that we opened with. Am I right? But then he goes on to say this, by the fact that they themselves admit that these people are worthy of their God, they show that they want and are able to convince only the foolish, dishonorable, and stupid, and only slaves, women, and children. If you think about it, he is on to something. But this is the great message of the gospel. The great mystery of the gospel is that this is an open invitation for anyone. It will be those who accept it with childlike faith that will enter into the kingdom of heaven. Meanwhile, the proud and the lofty will perish. And so we have to stay there in that place. We have to always remember that it was no great work of ours that got us here in the first place. To put it in the language of that text, not many of us were wise or powerful or of noble birth, but God chose the foolish and the weak and the low in order to shame the wise, the strong, and the things exalted so that none can boast before God, but rather, if there is any cause to boast, it is to boast in God. But let me ask you, how are you doing with grabbing hold of this gospel message in your life? Are you, believer, preaching this message to yourself routinely? When you encounter hardship, do you remember that which your, suffer, your Savior endured for you? When you are treated unjustly, do you preach to yourself the message that, number one, you don't deserve any better? 
And number two, that he will come again to right the course of this fallen world, to punish evil, to rescue once and for all his children, to restore creation, to undo all the wrong done. Do you let the gospel dictate your attitude? The attitude that you take throughout with you, or throughout you, throughout your day. You know what I'm trying to say. Because this message should humble us, you guys. Because we know that we are wretched sinners, ill-deserving of God's grace, and because we know that it was no great quality of ours that made God love us. It should inspire us to press on with a godly vigor, to work hard for Christ out of grateful obedience, knowing that we were bought with a price, a costly price. Are you seeing it impact your relationships? Are you giving grace because you've been given a measurable grace? Do you recognize um, that the sin that you think you see in your brother and sister is nothing compared with the sin that you know about in your own life? Folks, how can we expect the gospel to impact us in all those areas if we're not preaching it to ourselves in our quiet time? We have to rehearse it. That's why we run through it every week in our home groups. That's why we come here every Sunday and why you'll hear it in every message from this pulpit. We need to be refreshed on this over and over and over again. We are prone to drift away from the gospel, not toward it. We're in a river with a strong current, a current influenced by the enemy, the world, and our flesh, and the direction that current is flowing is in the direction of sin, of apathy, of spiritual lethargy. We have to fight that current in order to move in the direction of holiness. And that means we have to take the time to intentionally do this. But here's the thing, if we do it really well, it'll actually prepare us for these next couple pieces. Here's our second point for the morning. Defend the gospel. Defend the gospel. What exactly do I mean by defend the gospel? Is the gospel vulnerable to attack? Is it in danger of becoming obsolete or extinct? Absolutely not. What I mean by defending the gospel is what theologians would call apologetics. I have a definition for you. We're going to have it on the screens. Apologetics is the field of study and practice concerned with defending and contending for the Christian faith with the ultimate goal of bolstering the faith of believers and denouncing false forms of religious belief. The field of study and practice concerned with defending and contending for the Christian faith with the ultimate goal of bolstering believers' faith and denouncing false forms of religious belief. We get this from the Greek word apologetomai, which is the verb, which is to uh, apologize That's not, it doesn't translate exactly in the English that we normally use apologize for, but the definition is this, to speak in defense against charges presumed to be false. To speak in defense against charges presumed to be false. There's another word that's often thrown around in this conversation in the Bible, and that's martyreo. Again, I say, um, or perhaps that was a That was a private prayer meeting. You might not have heard that. Uh, But the word for martyr comes from this, martyreo, and this is to confirm or attest something on the basis of personal knowledge or belief. It's to bear witness. It's to offer testimony. Specifically, within this realm of apologetics, I would endorse a specific form of apologetics called presuppositional apologetics. And I won't spend too much time here, okay? So if, if you don't want to get nerded out with me, that's fine. We won't be here long, okay? But indulge me for a moment. Presuppos- presuppositional apologetics is not only hard to say, <laughs> but it basically means this. We never abandon the Bible in our attempt to persuade somebody else of the reality of what it says. Now that might sound silly, right? Why would you try to persuade somebody of the truth of the Bible without the Bible, Right? But the truth is, many people try to reason by taking up hypotheticals, okay? They'll say something like, well, let's say there is a God. Or they'll play a game on the terms of the people that they're dealing with. So if they're dealing with an atheist and they're trying to bring science into the matter, they'll try and reason on the grounds of science. They'll point to it and say, look how much faith it takes to believe your theories, Now, that is a true statement, but that is also to forfeit the high ground. The Bible is the objective standard for all truth in the world. 
And we wouldn't put away facts or statistics in any other debate on a given subject. So just because, uh, excuse me, just because somebody doesn't believe them to be true, so why would we do so with the Bible, the ultimate authority? Just because you don't think it's true doesn't make it any less true. And so when we speak, we don't say, I believe there is a God, though we do believe. Rather, we tell people there is a God. He has revealed himself in his word and in these last days by his son. And it's true that all of science and reason and logic confirms everything that the Bible says. But we start with the latter and not the former. Period. Well, where do we get this notion of apologetics in the Bible? We could go to a place like Jude 3. Uh, Jude writes this, Beloved, Although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Why? Verse 4, For certain people have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, Jude was commending the saints to defend the faith in the face of false teachers. They had slipped into their midst and they were perverting the gospel, turning it into something that it wasn't. And he's saying, you contend for the faith there. How about 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5? Paul writes to the Corinthians, For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. When we engage in apologetics, that's what we're doing. We are destroying strongholds of the mind. We are destroying arguments and lofty opinions raised against the knowledge of God. We are calling people to face the lies that they have believed. We're exposing them, those lies, that is, for what they are. What does this look like? Well, I would argue that you could defend the gospel in two ways. From false teachers within the church or within the faith, like Jude called believers to, and from false religions outside of it. Let's look at those individually. Well, what does it look like to defend the faith from a false teacher, defend the gospel from a false teacher? Well, this could be somebody who claims to come, this would be somebody who claims to come in the name of Christ, who claims to be a brother or sister in Christ, but who is preaching to you or to others something that does not accord with Orthodox Christianity. They're peddling a false doctrine, whether knowingly or unknowingly, and you are called to respond to what they are saying. This could be, Lord, may it never be, someone in your home group. And before we get into this, do I mean something like if somebody disagrees with where you stand on the end times? No. I'm talking about foundational, basic Christian doctrine, like they're saying that Jesus isn't God or that he's already come again, or that the resurrection wasn't real, or something like that, that requires an answer, a response. And in order to do that, we need discernment. I would point to Proverbs 26, 4 through 5, which says, Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest you be like him yourself. But then it goes on to say, Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. Well, which one is it? The answer is, it depends. We need to use our God-given, spirit-empowered skills of discernment because there are some people that need to be rebuked who could be leading others astray with their words. This is the fool who is liable to be wise in his own eyes and he needs to be corrected. In such cases, I would say, as you hear them say these things that you know not to be true and you get that feeling in your gut that's saying, hey, you can't say that about my God, I would say you should listen to that. Now let me caution you along with that. It's almost always better to lead with a question. Something like, hey, did you mean what you said back there? Because that's not the picture of Jesus I get in the Gospels or whatever example suits the context. But the thing about that is, we ask that question because we could also be wrong. There's another type of person in this category and they totally don't mean to peddle heresy. 
And if you lovingly ask that question, you'll be glad you did. And if you're not sure, I would say let that interaction be be between you and them privately so that if they are well-meaning and just either misinformed or they just mince their words, you can lovingly steer them in the right direction free from embarrassment. But what what about the person who doesn't claim to be a Christian? What does defending the gospel from false religions look like? Well, imagine for an instance a Jehovah's Witness comes to your door or a Mormon. I would say here too, it pays to use discernment. Many people will have no doubt fallen victim to these false religions and are actually, in fact, genuinely seeking. Perhaps the Lord is already working on their heart. Perhaps they have already become burdened by a godly grief. That's how they landed in that religion in the first place. Whether they can put their finger on it or not, it may be that they themselves have been led astray and they are not hardened to the gospel as others are. In such cases, what an opportunity. Where there is room for conversation, we should take it. We should ask questions like, what does eternity look like for you? And how is that ascertained? You don't need to know everything about their religion in order to recognize, oh, they're trying to earn their way to heaven. That's where you can apply logic to say, well, can you be sure you've done enough good works to accomplish that? If they're honest, many practitioners of false religions will tell you they can't exactly be sure. And that they're just hopeful that the scales will, scales will be tipped in their favor on the last day. But that's where your Christian worldview comes in. You can be sure because it's not up to you, but on the unchanging character of God. Jesus accomplished it for you. It's a free gift of grace that you receive by repentance and faith in him. But that's not always how it will go. And there are some that have no interest in hearing what you have to say. That's just the brass tacks of it. These are the fools that can make a fool out of you if you try to have that conversation. Um, I'll tell you about my first trip to the mall to evangelize with some brothers and sisters. Um, I didn't take the evangelism class that they took, okay? Just a little preface. So I didn't know, I was unlearned. And I'm not saying you have to in order to evangelize, okay? But um, there are certain tips and tricks that you can learn that we're going through in this lesson that I didn't know. And uh, I started talking to a guy, and he's like, oh, are you proselytizing? And I'm like, never heard that word in my life. Maybe. And he's like, oh, it's when you try to convert other people to your religion. I was like, oh, cool. Yeah, kind of. Uh, Do you want to talk about it? And he's like, yeah, for sure. I have an undergrad in religious studies. I'm like, great. I stood there for, I think, an hour and a half with this guy uh, before you know, I eventually got him in something because he was a a relativist thinker, which means that truth is relative. And um, eventually I said, well, I don't need to hear what, I don't need to listen to what you have to say on that because all truth is relative, right? And I don't see it that way. And he got super mad and told me that, um, you know, he told me some things. And uh, that's where the conversation ended. I wished him well. And, uh, and then somebody, one of the guys that I was there with came over and was like, oh yeah, that kind of person. Well, we would normally say, I don't think we're going to find agreement on this and move on. (laughs) And I'm like, where were you an hour and a half ago, you know? (laughs) But to go back to what I mentioned about false teachers, even that person can still be a fruitful endeavor in certain circumstances because they could be smearing the name of the Lord in front of others. And in such case, it may behoove you to make a defense for the sake of those hearers. And in that case, I would call to mind what Peter said in 1 Peter 3 when he wrote, we all know this one, but in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to give a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect so that when, excuse me, having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. We ought always to be, pre- be prepared to give a defense but we are to do it in a very particular way. Did you catch that? Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ Jesus may be put to shame. It may be the case that you, you can engage with somebody who has no intention of uh, laying their arms down, so to speak, and they may become argumentative, but as you remain cool-headed and as you continue to apply logic, not seeking to stick it to them, but trying to do the first part of that passage, honor Christ the Lord as holy, it may be that you actually convince somebody else. 
I had the privilege of partaking in a, a separate evangelism effort some years ago, and I say partaking because there were a couple of guys that really led the charge in it. I only chimed in a couple of times, but they were defending the gospel with this store clerk who had fallen victim to a, a, a universalist Christian cult. Well, when it was all said and done, she was no more persuaded of what they were saying and no, no uh, more dissuaded in her own beliefs. But, but then a remarkable thing happened. One of the guys who was there, it turned out, wasn't actually saved. And in the course of trying to defend the faith from somebody caught up in a false religion, this guy ended up being ministered to. And later that night, this guy seemingly repented of his sins and put his faith in Jesus. And so it may be that you're not even witnessing to the person that you're speaking to, so much as the onlookers, depending on how private or public the situation is. That's awesome. God uses it all. But here's the thing. To do it with gentleness and faith, and excuse me, gentleness and respect, that's great. But in the end, you do need to be prepared to give a defense for the hope that is in you. In other words, we need to have God's word in us. How are you going to defend God's word unless you know it? We need to be not just uh, rehearsing the gospel, which is the summary of Christian doctrine, the summary of what's in the Bible, but we need to be in the Bible itself. We need to constantly be rooted in Scripture, constantly washing ourselves afresh in it. Just as we are preaching the gospel to ourselves, so too we should be reading the word that informs that gospel message. We each have to do this. We each have to be prepared for these conversations. Otherwise, the opportunity will come and we won't know what to do. I was recently watching a sermon. Uh, my dear brother, Pastor Derek of uh, Harvest Barbados. He's a pastor of a church in Barbados. Very different worship service than we have here. Uh, a lot more movement, um, which is so cool to see. And he's just an excellent extempor extemporaneous preacher. But, but he, he talked about how if we're not in our word, we're going um, to get to those opportunities, those situations, and we're, we're not going to know what to do. And he said, I, I only wish that my home group leader was here. I only wish that my pastor were here. But here's the thing. Your pastor isn't there. Your home group leader isn't there. God has you there, and you need to be prepared. Like so many other things that we've talked about in this series, this is all of our responsibilities. It's your responsibility, church. It's not reserved for the spiritually mature or the leaders alone. It's for every Christian. But there's one more thing that's for every Christian. And that's that we need to declare the gospel. We need to declare the gospel. This section is, of course, about evangelism. Now I'm going to say something that may or may not blow your mind. We'll see. But none of the times that the Bible talks about um, preaching the gospel, none of those times does it use a verb that we often hear it used. And that's the word share. The Bible never once says share the gospel or share your faith. Nothing even close to it. The words that we get are euangelizomai, which is to proclaim the good news. Ke russo, which is to preach or proclaim publicly a message. And katangelo, to report or announce something publicly. Now you might be wondering, hold on Pastor Max, I'm pretty sure I've heard you talk about evangelism in terms of sharing the gospel before. And you would be right. I'm not here to ban the use of the word from your vernacular, but I am here to emphasize a couple of different things that we can learn from that. First, this goes back to what we said about presuppositional apologetics. We who have been saved and are walking with the Lord for any significant amount of time, we know this to be true. We have seen the Lord's faithfulness too many times. We know that it's all real, not because the science checks out, though it does, but because God has put his love in our hearts, and we can feel it in our bones. His spirit within us cries out. He is real. We don't want to say, this is what I believe. This is the truth. And because we know it to be true, we don't just dance around the subject. That doesn't mean that we blurt it out in the first awkward silence that we get in a conversation, okay? Like, Jesus died for sinners. <laughs> you don't have to do that. But it does mean that we don't say it as if it's our opinion. We're talking about the Word of God, so we say it with certainty. 
And along with that, it's authoritative. One of the nuances that we find in the Greek word is this notion of heralding. We are heralding the good news. You are no longer the guy who is on equal terms with the other guy at the water cooler. No, you are enlisted by the king of kings to go before him. You are the person who says, hear ye, hear ye, a message from the king. The royal herald does not water down the message. You go tell people, and you do so with boldness. And hear me when I say That authority is not just like a a wet seal on the scroll that you're reading from. It's not like uh, the signature of the king's approval. No, the very message is imbued with the power of God for salvation. That's what Romans 1.16 means when it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. I'm not ashamed of this message because wherever this message gets preached, people get saved. I'm not saying that everyone is going to get saved every single time. That's not what I'm saying, but it does mean that it has the power to do so. Back to our opening text. For the word of the cross, in other words, the gospel, is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. This message brings with it the power of the Almighty. It brings with it the power to bring dead hearts to life. You want to see a miracle? Go preach the gospel. Is this message not precious to you? Did you not at some point believe it yourself? Did you not see the transformational power firsthand? That's what I mean when I say if this message is truly precious to us, if we really recognize what it means to us, then we will want others to experience that same power of God that we who are being saved know so well. But you will say, if it's so powerful, why will some still reject it? And that brings to us the matter of God's sovereignty. For the uninitiated, when we talk about God's sovereignty, we talk about how God is the creator and ruler over all creation, including human beings. And as a result, he is in complete control over this whole process of evangelism. It does not negate our role in it, and it does not diminish the decisions that we make, which are important in God's plan, but it does mean that nothing happens in the evangelism process apart from the Lord's will. That means that whether they reject it or they receive it and repent and believe, it was all working out exactly as God had planned it. What a grace. What a comfort. That's why Isaiah 55, 10 and 11 tells us that God's word always succeeds in the thing for which he sent it. Now, many have tried to say in response to this, well, then why evangelize? If God is the one in control of it all, if he is so sovereign, if he wants to save people, what does he need us for? Well, for one, it's a command. Matthew 28, 18 through 20, we are to go and make disciples. But for two, this is the means that he uses to save sinners. I don't know why he made it this way. But this is how he decided it would go. Paul talked later on in 1 Corinthians about how he planted and then Apollos watered, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. In other words, God is the one who saves, but he uses our efforts. And this is a crucial understanding. J.I. Packer, in his book, Evangelism and the Sovereignty of God, he put the relationship between human effort and God's sovereignty this way. He said, in the Bible, divine sovereignty and human responsibility are not enemies. They are not uneasy neighbors. They are not in an endless state of cold war with each other. They are friends, and they work together. At the same time, though, he would emphasize elsewhere in the same book if we forget though that only God can give faith we shall start to think that the making of converts depends in the last analysis not on God but on us and that the decisive factor in the way in which we evangel and and that it is the decisive factor in the way in which we evangelize and in this line of thought consistently followed through will lead us astray it's up to God to change hearts What a relief. It's not on you. You don't have to get it just right. You're just the sower that Jesus was talking about in Matthew 13, the parable of the sower. You've got the sower who's just scattering seed. He's not thinking twice about what kind of soil it's falling on, though there are different kinds of soil that produce different kinds of growth. 
he's not discerning. And even more so than the, than the sower who probably could have looked at the soil and determined what kind of soil it was, we have no way of knowing what's in a person's heart. It may be that our gospel message falls on what appears to be the hardest of soil, the hardest of hearts. It might be the person most hateful toward God outwardly that goes home later and cries his eyes out over their sin. But our job is not to evaluate the soil. It's to spread the good news. It's to herald the message to those who may one day be God's people and you won't know until you preach it to them. Let's get practical here for a moment, shall we? Let's answer some questions. How do you get started? It starts with prayer. Pray for gospel opportunities. I promise you if you're praying for it, you're going to see these start to pop up. And when you do, do, you'll see them pop up everywhere. And everything will start to look like a gospel opportunity. Isn't that what Paul did in Acts 17? He said, hey, I noticed you guys had a plaque dedicated to the unknown God. Let me tell you about the unknown God. <laughs> they weren't Christians. That wasn't a specifically Christian altar. But he saw it and he used it as a jumping off point. I think one time I was talking to somebody about how much pets love their owners. I was like, man, I got to tell you, if you think that's love, let me tell you about what God did. Maybe it's more intentional than that. Maybe you're not waiting for the opportunity to come around. Maybe there's somebody that you're, you're thinking about in particular. I'm sure there's somebody that you're thinking about in particular. Maybe it looks like reaching out to them intentionally and asking them to lunch. Maybe you're frank and upfront and you say something like, hey, I've been burdened for your soul. And if I really love you, like I say I do, I have to tell you this. And then you get into the gospel. Maybe it looks like asking to bless the food this Thanksgiving and weaving the gospel into your prayer. Whatever it looks like, you will just have to dive in, though. But when you do, you'll be so glad that you did. You'll be blessed regardless of how they respond. Okay, well, what's important to be included? I got to share it. Great. What do I say? I personally do a four-fingered approach. There's a holy God. We sinned against him. But God, he sent Jesus. Jesus lived a perfect life, died a sinner's death, um, resurrected for our salvation. Response. Holy God, we sinned, but God, response. And that response is repent and believe. Do you need to include everything every time? I would argue no. But what should not be left out? Sin should not be left out. There is no good news unless you know what you're being saved from, unless you know what's at stake. Jesus' person and work should also not be left out. God died on a cross for us. You'll want to communicate that. Paul almost always mentions two things, Jesus' death and his resurrection. Those are essential, and there should be a call to action. If they don't know what to do to respond, then you've just given them a burden and no action plan. Okay, well, what about relationship building? I'm just working on my relationship with this person, then I'll share the gospel with them. Well, to be clear, I think that's good and proper. But at some point, you do have to give them the gospel. I think of two examples. The first one is, um, there's a book called Secret Thoughts of an Unlikely Convert by Rosario Butter Butterfield. Um, fantastic book uh, on a, a woman who was engaged in a homosexual relationship, was on the, the Pride Committee, I think it was, a professor at um, Syracuse University, um, just completely radically changed. And it was all through the efforts of one man, a Presbyterian minister, and his wife who would have her over for dinner, and they didn't shove the gospel down her throat, okay? And over the course of uh, many months having dinner together, just talking through things, she became curious. She went to the church eventually. Well, now she's married to a man, you know, has kids, has written all these bestsellers and everything, and it's a really sweet story, and I think it's just a testament to the fact that, you know, there's, there are times where you don't have to share it. <laughs> you know, there are times where um, you want to be patient with the person, and you're reading the room, and you recognize uh, this is not going to go over well right here, and I'm going to be patient, and I'm just going to love on these people. I think your neighbors are a great opportunity. You don't, you don't necessarily have a, a witnessing opportunity at the mailbox every single day, Right? but you can love on them, you can invite them over, and perhaps the opportunities will come from that. 
So that can work well, but what I want you to do is hold that intention along with this other concept. And to illustrate that, I'm going to borrow from my brother, Pastor Derek in Barbados again. He recently told the story of D.L. Moody and an evangelistic sermon that he preached. He told his congregants to think it over and come back the following week. Well, sadly, that message would line up perfectly with the Great Chicago Fire of 1871, and many of those people did not make it back the following week. He vowed to never let that happen again. And I think we should pay great heed to that counsel. There really needs to be a sense of urgency. Tomorrow is not promised. I think of the parable that Jesus told in Luke 12 of the man who had stored up for himself treasures on earth, who, who got a second barn just, just to store it all. And these he used to comfort his disquieted soul. But then we read these words in Luke 12, 20. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? That should stoke in us a burning desire to see our loved ones saved. We ought to be broken over their state and want them to be reconciled to God today, if at all possible. And if you're here today and you are not in Christ Jesus, let me encourage you in the same vein. You might not have tomorrow. And if tonight your soul were required of you, would you be prepared to see the Savior would you be confident that you would enter into eternal rest or would there be a judgment waiting for you? Let me urge you to repent of your sins and put your faith in Jesus. And if you have any questions, I'll be by the door. I would love to answer them for you. Well, what about this one? This is a great uh, example. We hear this one all the time. Live out the gospel, right? You don't necessarily need to preach it. You've probably heard it said like this, preach the gospel and if necessary, use words. Great bumper sticker, not the best practical application. It's true there are going to be times, as previously mentioned, that you can't or shouldn't speak. There was an instance that I uh, entered into where I was uh, forbade from speaking. Is that the right word, forbade? Forbidden? I was forbidden from speaking. Um... And as such, all I could do was showcase God's love through my actions. But Romans 10, 17 tells us faith comes from hearing and hearing the word of Christ. In other words, if we don't preach, they don't get saved. Our preaching is the vehicle that God chooses to use to initiate faith in another. This is a weighty responsibility. But let me hopefully ease your mind. I know there's a lot of things that can get in the way of us evangelizing our unbelieving friends and family. Things like a fear of souring their relationship or a fear of not having all the answers or a fear of being rejected by them or just plain old fear. To those things I would say, you're worried about the relationship? Well, if you really care about them, there is nothing more loving that you could do than to preach the good news to them, to seek to spare them from hell and to see them reconciled to God. And they might not recognize that. They might not recognize that, that you are burdened for their soul. But many will. You're worried about not having all the answers? Join the club. There will be times when you don't have all the answers. But where you say, you know what, let me get back to you on that. You've actually just created another opportunity. An opportunity to follow up with them with a more complete answer. Which further shows your love for them and intentionality. And that may well be the thing that God uses to break down their walls. You're worried about rejection? Okay. Well, Jesus promises those. He promises that there will be rejection because he was rejected. But he also tells us that we will be blessed whenever we are reviled for his name's sake. And in fact, we put ourselves in the company of the great prophets of old when we do so. I'll take that. Maybe you're just plain scared and you don't know why. Again, I say, join the club. I don't know anybody who isn't. I don't know anybody who feels like it every time. But we're not called to do it when we feel like it. And sure, it takes courage, but it's not about courage. Just like confronting a brother in sin, like we talked about last week, wasn't about faith. This is also really about obedience. We're called to do it as an act of obedience. And ultimately, what it comes down to is, is this thing precious to you or not? 
Consider how much we want our loved ones to watch the TV series we just discovered or the book we just read. How much more precious to us is the gospel of our salvation, is our Lord and Savior? How much more should we want to share him with anybody who will listen? I'm not saying you bulldoze your way through every conversation. Be judicious. But still, we should be on the lookout for those opportunities. And the truth is, if you're dwelling on the gospel like God's word calls us to by rehearsing it to yourselves in the presence of God in prayer, if you're being prepared to give a defense for it by being rooted in God's word, then you'll be ready for these opportunities. And if you really really love people, you'll want to do this. You'll want to proclaim the gospel to them that they might be saved. Now I'm going to close by reading the whole of, well, the whole of these four verses, Romans 10, 14 through 17. This will be our call to action for this week. Paul writes, how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Let us be a people who proclaims this gospel message in this house and to our loved ones, maybe even at the dinner table on Thanksgiving this week, for God's glory and for the good of our fellow man. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you for the gospel. Lord, thank you for not leaving us in our sin, leaving us helpless and destitute without a way to get back to you. Thank you for calling us by your name. Thank you, Lord, that we who have repented and believed, uh, we are counted among your flock as those sheep who did recognize the voice of their shepherd and came when he called. And Lord, I pray that you would use, uh, use this flock, use us sheep, to go find others, God, to proclaim your message that they might hear your voice proclaimed through us and repent and believe and join our number. Lord, we are burdened for for so many people in our lives. God, there are so many people on my prayer list that I just say, God, save them, and then get to the next person and say, God, save them too. And then I get to the next person, and God, would you open their eyes to the gospel, and the next person, God, would you bring them to repentance and faith in you, Lord? There are so many on our heart. Lord, would you make us increasingly more heartbroken over their state before you? Let us refuse to give up praying for them, ministering to them, uh, just seeking opportunities to be around them so that we can proclaim the gospel. And Lord, um, just on the off chance that that gives license to sin, Lord, I pray that um, we would take those opportunities only as is fitting for Christian behavior. We don't go try to minister to them at the bar or what have you. But God, we praise you for this gospel. And we pray that you would give us um, obedient hearts. Courageous hearts, yes, but obedience to these commands. And that you would save many people as a result of these efforts, your efforts through us. Lord, we, uh, we want to do it all for you. Because we love you. Because you have loved us so greatly. We pray it all in the name of Jesus Christ, our salvation. Amen.